The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. John 16, verse 8, And when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on Me. Of righteousness, because I go to My Father and you see Me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So you have the issue here of sin, righteousness, and judgment. These are big things. They're very powerful in the way they're set forth for you in the Bible. Let's look at sin first of all. Now remember, when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, that taketh away all the sins of the world, right? It's not what he said, what did he say? The sin of the world, right? So it means something more than just simply sin in the sense that something has happened. It has to do with the very essence of what sin is about. Now look at how he deals with these people. Look at Matthew chapter number 12 and verse 31. How many's ever heard of the sin of the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? Here we find in Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. He said, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, now note that carefully in your mind, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now why make a difference? Why would they not be equal? Why would it not be the same? to sin against the Son of Man or the Holy Spirit. I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 13 and verse number three. Now the Bible says in verse one, the same day Jesus went out of the house, sat by the seaside. Great multitudes were gathered together to him. So he went into a ship and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore and he spake many things unto them in what? Parables, saying behold, and then he gets into the parables. Now when did this happen? This happened immediately after Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 31. Look at this, the sin against the Holy Ghost. He's teaching them and now he does something. And what does he do? He presents parables to them. Look at verse 13, Matthew 13. He said, therefore speak I to them in parables. Now look what he quotes. But because they seeing see not and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. In plain words, he says, I'm going to blind them, so they can't be saved. That's what he said. That's the text. Now look how it worked out. Go back and look at it again. He says to them in verse number 31, you can commit the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and there's no forgiveness for it. So what does he do for the Jew? Well, in chapter number 13, he begins to speak to them in parables. And in verse number 13, chapter 13, verse number three in parables. And then in chapter number 13, verse 13, he tells you what the parable is for. Let's put it together. He says, I am gonna take you and you're gonna reject the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to speak against the Holy Ghost. So I'm going to blind you and I'm going to blind you. And when I blind you, it's going to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah chapter number six. Therefore, I will put you in a place where you cannot blaspheme the Holy Ghost. That's what's happening here. That's a powerful statement because when you go back to the book of Isaiah chapter number six, it's quoted a number of times in the New Testament. And every time it's quoted in the New Testament, it is in a critical point. So the Apostle Paul tells you in Romans chapter number 11, God hath blinded them to the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So for them, he has secured them where they cannot speak against the Holy Ghost and commit the unpardonable sin. Now digest that for a moment. That's quite a thing, don't you think? This is the sin of all sins. When he has come, he will convince the world of sin because they believe not on me. And so here he takes them and he blinds them. Now the Apostle Paul is a type of them that should hereafter believe on him. That's what he said. The Apostle Paul was a Christ-hating Jew going to Damascus to get letters to come to the synagogues and you know, drag the Jews out anywhere he could find them and literally lock them up and in many cases stone them to death. But what happened to him? He had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And then what happened? Scales came onto his eyes. And when he went into the house of Ananias, he could not see, he was blinded, and he had had a personal encounter with Christ. And when 
Ananias baptized him, these scales fell from his eyes and he was able to see. And once he was able to see, then he took in typology the place of the Jew as he is today. When will the Jew get saved, preacher? When they look upon him whom they have pierced. When is that? That's when he comes to this earth. This is how it explains Matthew chapter 24, the five wise, the five foolish virgins. The Lord Jesus Christ is gonna come and make a personal appearance to the Jewish people. Don't you think he's preparing them right now? Have you ever seen anti-Semitism like it is now? Have you noticed that in this country, the liberal Jews that have supported everything that is anti-God and anti-Christ, now you can read in the Jerusalem Post, you can read anything that comes out of Israel, and it says plainly, they're changing their tune because now the very people that they have supported are turning on them. So what does that do? It makes them look above. It makes them look for the Messiah, for the Mashiach. The Lord Jesus is coming back. The purpose of the parable is to reveal to those that God wants to reveal to and to blind those that he wants to blind. That's what the parable's for. He gets the message across, but it's, 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 uh, you know, it's covered in mystery. That's what the parable is about. And of course, the parable is for mostly for we Gentiles. We receive it. We understand it. It's so, it's, you know, you can make a mistake to think, well, the Bible's very clear and simple to me in so many years. Yes, it is. But it's, a, it's an enigma to a lot of people. And the reason the Bible is open to you is because the Holy Spirit has opened it to you. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. Now, don't you to notice the second thing that he said he would do. He would judge the world in righteousness. Now, what does that mean? Well, in Romans chapter number 10, he said, My brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He said, I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they're being ignorant of God's righteousness. Now, this is the righteousness that matters, is God's righteousness. But you see, when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, he lived a sinless, obedient, perfect life. Therefore, he was the righteous one. And what qualified him to ascend into the very presence of Almighty God was the fact that he was sinless, perfect. And therefore, he was righteous. He was the righteous one. When Judas Iscariot says, I have betrayed the innocent blood, he was preaching to high heaven, this is the only righteous one that has ever walked this earth. That's what he's talking about. And so the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to the presence of the Father, was, re was received into his presence based on not the righteousness of the one sitting on the throne, but the righteousness of the one who lived a sinless, perfect life on this earth. And that righteousness becomes my righteousness and your righteousness. For Paul said in 1 first, first Corinthians, he has made unto us righteousness. Now watch how he uses this. If you turn to Romans 10, you'll see something that, uh, that's quite remarkable. In verse number four of Romans chapter number 10, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. In plain words, the law could never attain to that. The law in itself is righteous, the law is holy. There's nothing wrong with the law, but do you know anybody that can keep it? Of course not, so why? What was the purpose of the law? To bring us to Christ. Paul said in Galatians, a school master to bring us to Christ. That's the purpose of the law. It was to show us that we cannot save ourselves. When you find a man who says he doesn't sin, you're looking at either a self-deceived individual. I mean, he's just flat missing a cog somewhere. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Look at verse four. He's the end of the law, verse five. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Now look at this. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. You know what that's saying? That is saying, don't believe or listen to someone who tells you that the Lord Jesus Christ was not righteous enough to ascend into the very presence of God by his own righteousness. Don't believe it. He did ascend into the presence of God by his own righteousness. So if you say the question, who can do that? See, it's a rhetorical thing. Who can ascend into heaven? You're asking a question and giving the answer in the question, see? There's nobody that can do that. That's the implication. Nobody can live a sinless, perfect life. But the apostle says, oh, yes, they can. Because if you make a statement like that with a question like that, you're bringing Christ back down from above. For he has ascended above and he is at the right hand of the Father. Therefore, if you want to be saved and you take someone to Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a simple statement, isn't it? Yes. Did you notice that it doesn't give a formula about how to call? It just says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Here's where you get to. You get to this point. Lord, you're better than me. 
You're righteous and I'm not righteous. You died on the cross for me. You shed the precious blood of Christ for me. You are the anointed one. You're the holy one. You're the righteous one. And my sins have all been laid upon your back. You became sin for me who knew no sin, that I might be made the righteousness of God in you. Amen. That's what the Bible says. That I might be made the righteousness of God in you. So therefore, Lord, my Lord Jesus Christ, I accept you as everything I need. You're everything that I need. Save my soul. Whatever word you choose to use. You know what will happen? He'll save you. Like the thief on the cross, you remember? What formula do you use for him? Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. If you could hear the prayers that are going up at this moment, I saw a thing this morning on, on the, somewhere, said that the, that the world has reached eight billion people alive on this planet. That's a whole lot of hearts beating. That's a bunch of people. And you know what? He died for every last one of them. Yes, he did. Because he became sin who knew no sin, that he might take sin away and the condemnation of sin. There is therefore now no judgment or no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Look now at number three. And this one is something that begins to open up progressive chronology for you. Of judgment. Verse 11, John 16, because the prince of this world is judged. So how's he judged? What does judgment consist of? When did it happen? Look at chapter 12 and verse 27 of John. He said, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Was there any doubt in his mind at any moment that he knew who he was and why he was here? Absolutely not. Father, glorify thy name. Then came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by heard it said it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of the world, of this world be cast out. Now look why it connects with it. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The Lord Jesus Christ purchased the right to judge the devil. And he purchased the right to judge the devil in his own home. In other words, Satan's domain. He's the God of this world. So the Lord Jesus Christ purchased the right to judge Satan in a manner that Satan could never have been judged before, now, or in the future. In plain words, God does everything legally. He's a holy, righteous God, and never one time will he deviate from holiness. He will never break his own righteous laws. He's perfect, pure, and holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And you remember I mentioned that the other day to you and told you it's only found two times in the whole New Testament. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now I'll show you something tonight. Some of you probably know this, but some of you may have never heard it. Satan started out as an anointed cherub that covers. Anointed means that he was a Mashiach or a Christos in the New Testament term. Mashiach or Messiah in Hebrew is the same. It's, uh, its counterpart in, the, in, 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 in Greek is uh, Christos or Christ. All right, same. Messiah, anointed one. That's what it means. So in the book of uh, Ezekiel chapter number 28 verse 14, he says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. This was when he was in the third heaven. The third heaven was created for creatures. The third heaven was not created for God. He doesn't need any place. God needs nothing, but it was created for creatures. And so he placed him there, and he placed him over all the singing of glory. He was the anointed cherub. He was beautiful in all of his ways. Read Ezekiel 28 when you get home and have time to read all that. No question, this cherub was beautiful. You say, well, he's an angel. Angel in the generic term means an angelic being, some kind of a spiritual being that is associated with heaven. You can understand it that way. But technically and literally, Satan is a cherub. And there were five of them. And these cherubim show up again in the book of Revelation. He's a cherub. The Bible says when they sinned against God, he put a cherub at the tree of life with a flaming sword to keep the way. A cherub. So what happens to him? He's cast out of heaven. Well, the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 12 and verse number 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And so what happens? Well, there's war in heaven. Michael, the only so-named archangel in the Bible, who stands for Israel, Daniel chapter number 12. When you connect it together, you'll find out that Satan being cast down to this earth, he's cast down to this earth because his place in heaven has been taken from him. In other words, he therefore becomes an earth dweller. He's stuck on this earth. And who does that to him? Michael. What happens is that this is, a, this is war between Israel and Satan. 
because Michael stands for Israel, amen, and Michael prevails, and Satan is cast down to this earth. Then he's cast down again. In Revelation chapter number 20, this is the fourth one, the Bible says he's cast into the bottomless pit. When does this happen? This happens when he comes to, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, and he comes back to establish his millennium, sit down on his throne in Jerusalem. He will take Satan, and he will cast him into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. And there he'll be for a thousand years. Then he takes him out at the end of a thousand years for a little while, doesn't tell us exactly how long. And when he does, there's another war, Gog and Magog's even mentioned all that. And then at the end of that, Satan is taken to his final place. And that's found in Revelation chapter number 20, verse number 10. He was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. In every progressive downfall, he grows more desperate. And you can see that desperation right now. You've never known a time on this earth. I do not believe this earth has ever seen a time like it's experiencing now. Hell has been opened. Every imaginable thing. My goodness, people, they got men kissing each other on TV now, selling their drugs. They force this in. It has nothing to do with the context of what they're trying to do. You, you, you get ready. This is mild compared to what's coming. Yeah, it's mild. It's mild because it's going to get worse and worse. The Bible said evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So yes, he judges. So the judgment is for this purpose, that the Lord Jesus Christ said that the Father now hath given to me all judgment. And he says, therefore, by giving it to me, he gives it to me because I've earned it. And then Revelation chapter number five and verse number nine, they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou was slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Worthy is the lamb. He's judgment in the book of Revelation, tribulation period. He is judging, he's opening seals. And who does this? Who does this? The Lord Jesus Christ as the lamb of God. That's coming. And I believe it's about here. I really do. I don't think we have much time left. One of the reasons I say that is because the, the perversion in this nation is accelerating. For example, 10 years, 20 years ago, it may take two or three years for some new thing to show up. Now, two or three weeks, it's accelerating. And who knows what's coming next? Who knows? All this talk about UFOs. I don't waste five seconds watching that stuff. You know, I know what a UFO is. What is it? It's demonic. That's what it is. So how do we live for God? We live for God by fellowship. Koinonia means to have in common. We both have in common. Spirit is in common. The conversation is in common. The communion is in common. We both are on the same wavelength, as they may say today. We're thinking about the same thing. If you set your affection on things above and not on things on this earth, if you love our Lord Jesus Christ and exalt Him and lift Him up the way we should, you're not going to have any trouble at all having fellowship with the Father and the Son. Not a bit. Well, I thought I had to live a sinless, perfect life. You have never lived a sinless, perfect life. As I told you earlier in the message, and nobody that you've ever met has ever lived a sinless, perfect life. And no man that's ever walked this earth has ever lived a sinless, perfect life but one. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Sinless, perfect life. So here are the two things. First thing you agree with God on is this. You agree that you cannot completely search your own soul. Do you really believe that you know everything in your soul, every sin that you've ever committed, that maybe that I'm talking about hasn't been confessed or covered up or spun away or whatever? I hope that you realize tonight, as the Apostle Paul said, he said, of all the sinners, I'm the chief, chiefest of sinners. When I would do good, evil is with me always, ever present. So you, com you, you convince that you say that. Psalm says in 139, search me, O God, and try me. You try me, Lord, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me. See the way, and lead me in the way of everlasting. That's step one. Now, the Bible says in 1 John that if you say you have no sin, verse 8, if you say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's as plain as it can be, folks. That's, that's fifth grade English. We deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Now, there are those who believe they can lose their salvation. They believe it. And they're sincere. A lot of them are good people. I don't question their motive, their, their love for the Lord. I don't question their bit. But how in the world are you going to square that with this text? Okay? Because if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. In order for you to not lose your salvation, you have to live essentially a sinless life. How do you get there? How do you get to the point of something is no longer a sin? Well, it's a mistake. Now, folks, let's not get into it semantics and start wrapping stuff up with garbage. Sin is sin, right? Now a lot of words for it. Uh, 
missing the mark, so forth. But we all sin, all right? I'm not proud of it. You're not proud of it. But we realize this because the Holy Spirit is making known to us what needs to be pushed out, covered up, so that He can talk to us. God Almighty is not one bit interested, not one bit. When you have a communication with Him, He's not one bit interested in learning what's inside you. He wants you to know what's inside you. He already knows. So if you agree with God that you have sinned, even though you may not be fully aware of it. That's the second point. You may have forgotten it. Lord knows, man, you could write an encyclopedia on the stuff I did before I got saved. But that was before. But in 1973, until now, that's been 50 years. You suppose I've deviated from the truth a little bit? You suppose I've failed? You suppose I've come short? You suppose that, uh, that some of the old sins might have risen up in my life? Well, of course they have. So what do you do? Well, here's what it says. 1 John 1.10 If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a what? A liar. That takes some gall. I mean, you really got to get to a point in your life to where you say, now, hold on. I'm sinless. I'm going to live the kind of life I need to live so that when I die, I'm going to heaven. God says, you're calling me a liar. And that's tough stuff right there. No, confess it. Agree with him. He doesn't do it to condemn you. He's not doing it to beat you down. He's not doing it to take you somewhere and lock you up. He's doing it so there'd be no hidden things between you and the Lord that you come out you open up. That's where God's able to deal with us and who we are. It's when you come out and open up and say, Lord, if there be any wicked way in me, open it up. God, show me. I'm incapable of delving into the depths of it, dissecting it and taking it apart and finding out exactly what caused it to begin with. You do it, Lord. And he has his way of doing it. And he does it by a number of ways. I told you this morning, when you go through a trial, you'll find out what you really think about God. You get square one, that's square one. That's the basics. You make up your mind that you are not going to turn loose of God Almighty. You're going to hold on to Him regardless of what happens. You've made your mind up that that's what you're going to do. Let this mind be in you. You've made your mind up. You're not going to turn loose of Him because that's exactly what Satan wants you to do. And then your sins will be another way for God to tell you what your sins are. Have you ever been tempted to do something that you did before you got saved? Have you been tempted to go back to the old life that you lived before? you got saved? Have you been tempted to go back to the old haunts that you, you, you know, you frequented? Have you been tempted to? Well, I was. I hadn't been saved all that long and I'd drive by some of the beer joints I used to go to. But of course I had a purpose in it. I'd look over and say, I'm not coming in there anymore. I'm finished with you. But it reminds me because there is a place where I came from. You see, these sins have a way of opening you up, don't they? And everybody has a besetting sin. Some of you have sins tonight that eat you up that doesn't bother me one bit, but some sins bother me that don't bother you. That's just the way we're made. But just keep this in mind. This happens because God wants fellowship with you. Remember this. God never condemns one of his children. There is therefore now no condemnation. What's that mean? That means God Almighty brings a hammer of judgment down on your soul and says, that's it. I'm going to talk to you. You've committed a sin and there's no forgiveness for it. Oh, yes, there is. There is forgiveness for it. It's when he keeps talking to you and keeps talking to you and keeps talking to you. And he chastens you and he chastens you and he chastens you refuse to listen to him, then you commit a sin unto death. And he doesn't tell you what it is, because if he told you what was mentioned any specific sin, which is a sin unto death, if you commit that sin, you make it up in your mind, Lord God, I've committed the sin unto death. He doesn't mention it. It's not the sin in particular, it's the state of your heart that gets you where you're headed for death. And then the third thing is this, Galatians chapter number six and verse number three. The Bible says, if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And the apostle says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, 4, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Don't ever compare yourself with other people. You don't know what kind of life they have to live. You don't know where they came from. You don't know what they're facing. You don't know where they're going. I don't want to swap my life with anybody's life. And some people tonight are living in, in their estimation in a much freer, you might say, more blessed life than I am. But I'm okay with my life because God knows me and he knows my life. I want to live the life that God's given me to live, not your life, but my life. Your life can be blessed of God, my life can be blessed of God. But it's very important to understand, I give him my life and say, Lord, I give myself to thee. I say this to God day in and day out. My life is in your hands. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what the apostle said. Your life is your life. Live your life. Live it for the Lord. When you walk out of this house tonight, remember this. Life is a special gift from God. It's a precious thing. 
Satan wants you to destroy yourself. When he's finished with you, there's nothing left. He wants you to destroy you. He cometh forth not but for the only purpose to kill and destroy and steal. That's Satan. He's a liar and a deceiver. He said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He wants you to live. He wants you to have a life. There's nothing wrong with being entertained. There's nothing wrong with laughing. Well, I won't look pious and holy if I left. I need to keep a big long face. That makes me look super spiritual. Oh, it doesn't smile. It's good for you. Go fishing. Go to the ocean. Go to the lake. Go somewhere. Enjoy the life God's given you. Amen. You young men, get you a girlfriend. Not a boyfriend. A girlfriend. And live out your days on this earth knowing the hand of God's on you. And he's given you a precious gift. And he'll make your life better. You'll never have a better life than that life you live for the Lord. For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Why don't we give you two of the biggest sins. And I'll close. Pride and self-righteousness. These are the biggies. And you can hide behind a religious facade. You can hide behind everything under the sun. But inside you're eaten up with pride. Nobody will dethrone you. Nobody's going to bring you down. Nobody's going to convince you of sin. No, 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 no. You're too good for that. You're better than everybody else around you. Come down off your high horse. None of us are better than anybody else. No, there's no respecter of persons with God. And self-righteousness is one of the worst things that you could have ever have happen to you. Lord have mercy. So what I learned, I've learned this. The greatest gift that God can give me is grace. Grace. Lord, be gracious to me. Be merciful to me. Amen. Be gracious and merciful. Amen. That's what I plead for tonight. Grace and mercy. Grace, grace, grace and mercy. What a wonderful thing it is. And he's a long-suffering, gracious God, don't you think? Oh, yes, he is. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.